Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Quantum Alignment Show. I started off with this sort of being a one-off topic, and I have, uh, after looking at sort of the slides that I put together today, I decided that this particular class might go on for a couple of other sessions. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about other factors that are making the times that we are in right now pretty notable and on a certain level, maybe even a little bit challenging. And I wanted to, I actually did the show for myself <laughs> because uh, I don't know how it is for you guys, but I'm, I've been really like surprised and frankly struggling a little bit with some of the things that I've been reading on social media to the degree to where I have really kind of backed away from my personal Facebook page in particular. And this isn't about these people said this or these people said that. I am, because of the nature of how human design works, I know that there's a lot of room for interpretation of information and that our own personal self and our own personal sense aligns with what's necessary for us to understand in the moment to facilitate our growth. So I don't want to start this presentation with the idea of, well, I know the truth and here's the truth, because I think anybody that tells you that is full of bunk. <laughs> and I'm, I'm telling you that from a point of view that truth and reality and how we perceive truth and reality when we understand the physics and the science behind perception and the biology behind perception is a very individual thing. And I do believe that in this cycle of evolution, that we're in the process of exploring how can we collaborate and co-create even if our perceptions of reality are different even if our values are different. And I think that the mastery of learning how to find the bridge between us, even if we seem very different from each other, is very, very important. One of my students slash friends said to me yesterday that it's kind of like as we're going through this evolution, we're all being kind of pushed through the eye of this needle. And if you think about, you know, that compression of all of us sort of having to kind of come together and move through this portal or this gateway into being in the world in a different way, in a way that isn't polar, polarized, that isn't binary in the way that it functions because of the evolving human design chart and the story of our own evolution that's built into human design, we see that we're moving out of a binary world, this or that, black or white, male, female, into a quantum world that has unlimited possibilities and unlimited permutations. And so we have to sort of transform into a new paradigm that opens us up away from this or that, this binary way of thinking that is so inflamed right now in our consciousness. That compression is sort of forcing us to have to shoulder up against each other and to discover not only those places where we're different, which seems to be where we're really focusing our energy right now, but also cause us to have to really look at where are we aligned? Where are, do we have commonality? Where can we find those places that creates expansiveness in the way in which we are together rather than divisiveness that's around looking at where are we different? I believe that our gene code tells us a lot about who we really are, that the genetic code of who we are has so much mystery in it and so much information in it. If we take ourselves down to a genetic level and we look at my genes versus your genes, we are so imperceptibly similar, <laughs> or rather I say we're so perceptively similar and so imperceptibly different. I mean, it's very hard to point to the genes that make us who we are in the context of all of the gene code that tells us how much alike we are. I think that we are learning, hopefully, as we go through this to individuate ourselves as our authentic selves, for sure. That's also part of what we're here to do at this moment. But we're also looking at how can we be who we are and allow others to be who they are 
and come together in a way that supports us in collaborating and creating ultimately a new era of sustainable, equitable, just peace. That's my preamble for today. <laughs> and now off my little soapbox and into a conversation about truth. How do you know what is true? And I think that this is a really humorous, in some ways, conversation to have through the lens of human design because human design says you're here to find your own truth, right? Your own inner authority is going to support you in discovering what is true for you. And at the same time, human design is, if you look at traditional human design, it's a system. It's called the human design system, right? And so a system by nature has a certain doctrine or pedagogy associated with it. So it's very tricky to teach a system that says, find your own truth. And sometimes that truth falls somewhere outside of the system and it creates a conundrum for the system itself and for the people learning the system. And it's certainly something I have wrestled with personally for many, many years. Um, and some of you may have felt that too. When you open up Facebook or you go to your family dinner table, because we have that in my family too, you might find there are a lot of different stories going on about what's happening on the planet right now. I want to break this down a little bit for you to speak specifically into how do you know what's true for you? How do you know what feels correct and aligned for you? And whether you're actually perceiving the truth that's yours or whether you're reacting to something else that's causing you to align with the truth that may be not actually be really true for you. I know that sounds like a lot, but I think the picture here says it all, right? <laughs> so um, I'm not exactly sure what these animals are. I think they're meerkats, but they're super cute, aren't they? Um, all right, so I just, I, I'm a, I found this cartoon from, from Carl Sagan, and I thought this was sort of a, a really good quotation to sort of begin our quest today. Uh, the quotation says, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. All right, so we are gonna explore intuition through the lens of human design. And I want to unpack a little bit about what is intuition and why is it important to knowing how you figure out what's true for you. You have right now in your current experience, you're down at the bottom of this chart in the white part. You are experiencing earth consciousness. You're a human being in a human story. That human story has linear time as part of its story. We all work on clock time. We all work on linear time. We're very deeply entrained in this dimension to go from one to two to three to four to five in a linear sequence. We create what we create or perceive what we perceive in our reality based on the meanings we have about what we're looking at. So if you have, for example, meanings about the idea of money, that might be meanings that are, let's say, this isn't uncommon. If you have meanings around money that say are tra traumatized, maybe you've struggled with money all your life. Maybe you have had a hard time creating the money you really wanted. Maybe you've had money experiences that as soon as you started to feel good about money, something awful happened, like your car broke down or somebody in your family got sick. Maybe money, the idea of money even creates a little bit of anxiety and tension in you. When you have those kinds of meetings around an idea like money, it causes your perspective, the way you see the world, it actually literally programs your brain to be able to see the world in a way that reflects the meanings you hold. So if you are frightened about money, let's say, when you look at the world, you're going to see the world through the lens of fear of money. And that's going to deeply impact everything that you perceive about money. It might even perceive, cause you to feel jealous of or have hatred towards people who have more money than you do. It, not because you necessarily hate them, 
but because your trauma around money allow it doesn't see you from seeing the expansive potential of money, but rather the limiting fear-based way of seeing money. Money is a supercharged topic. Um, so I should, probably shouldn't even use that example, but it's a really good example because it flavors, it conditions how we perceive information that's hitting us. Our conditioning, now we're on the pink part of the chart, our conditioning, our past experiences, our memories, the emotional artifact of our experiences, the things we learned from our parents, the things we felt in our chart, in our openness, our ancestral memories, our family lineage, our history with the idea of money conditions us and helps create the meanings that we hold. When we are looking into the world, which is a manifestation of consciousness, and we see the world, and we see not only the world, but we see potentials, things that aren't manifest yet, but things that we hope, wish, dream, aspire to. When we see the things available to us in the non-manifest reality or the quantum field, we can't see all the options available to us, even if they're right in front of us, if our conditioning is such that it doesn't favor us being able to see the possibilities that are maybe out of sync with the meanings that we're holding. Intuition, our intuition gives us a pass. It gives us an opportunity in flashes of insight, and we've all had them, to be able to leap over our conditioning in the moment. It's usually not something we can sustain, but it gives us flashes of insight in the moment to be able to leap over those meanings, to be able to leap over those conditionings, and to suddenly see possibilities, potentials, options that maybe we haven't ever been able to see before. That ability to leap over your conditioning and to begin to see broader options for yourself and your life is often gifted to us serendipitously in moments when we really need it. And oftentimes, honestly, in moments when we learn to surrender and go, I don't know what to do. Those are oftentimes our most profoundly intuitive moments because we get our brain out of the way, right? But it's a skill set. You can actually be train yourself over time to be able to consistently practice leaping over your own personal conditioning to see greater options and possibilities. This is the gift of any program. And, and there are many really great ones out there. There are many great programs out there that will teach you how to use that muscle to strengthen that intuitive muscle so that when you get into situations where you're having to belly up to your own conditioning field or you are looking at yourself in the mirror and you're trying to figure out what do I do next, where you can learn to tap into this intuitive awareness and over sort of bypass or leap over your conditioning and get bigger, usually better answers to the challenges facing you. In the next few quantum alignment shows that I'm going to teach, I want to talk to you about how do you deepen, how do you strengthen this intuition muscle? How do you lock into this way of being able, this, this skill set of being able to leap over your conditioning and to jump into the quantum field and see bigger, more expansive options for yourself and your life. So here's just a different way of looking at this. <laughs> your intuition kind of bypasses all of your human story and allows you to, through this different way of perceiving possibilities, leap over your conditioning and see expanded options through your, with your, the power of your intuition. The more we understand our intuition, as I said, the more we can bypass the personal self and tap into the cosmic plan. So in my little introduction today, I want to just talk to you about some basic things, some basic understandings that you can have to start helping you strengthen this muscle and become more intuitive. By the way, I, don't, I have taught this information in a couple of different permutations. The one thing I did not do with you guys today is just to tell you a little bit about my own personal background. Some of you may or may not know that uh, that I actually worked as a professional psychic medium for many years. I actually um, was listed. I don't I don't remember the organization that listed it anymore, but I was listed somewhere in some organization as one of the country's top fifty psychics, which I kind of find humorous because you're all top fifty psychics. 
But I will tell you that I've even had my brain studied because of my intuitive abilities. And that's not meant as a boast. That's really meant as a surprising. That was a very surprising twist and turn in my life. I am first and foremost, a scientist by training. I love science. I'm a big fan of science. I love research. And you give me a scientific study to read, and I am happy. That is how I like to spend my Saturdays, perusing data. Um, and when I was about in my mid-30s, uh, I had moved to Sedona, Arizona, uh, after being led there by responding to my sacral, and very quickly found myself to be uh, broke and struggling to raise my children by myself as my marriage sort of fell apart which is a very typical thing that happens when you move to those kinds of consciousness hotspots. And uh, this sort of falling apart of my life left me in a really difficult situation. And I had really kind of two choices. And the first choice was to go back to work as a nurse, which I could not in any way, shape or form get my sacral to respond to. And the other option was to big question mark. I didn't know what else I was going to do. I knew I didn't want to go back to work as a nurse. And I was really in a dire, dire situation where I was broke, so broke that I did not have the money for rent and rent was due in two days. And I got an opportunity in that sort of 11th hour. A friend of mine said, you should go down to the Sedona Center for the the Sedona Center for the New Age. I should have posted a picture of this because I go by there every once in a while when I go back to Sedona and it's kind of interesting to be there. But somebody said, go to Sedona for the Center for the New Age. They're hiring. I thought, well, okay. My sacral said yes. My brain was like, what the, right? But my sacral said yes. So I went to the Sedona Center for the New Age. I sat down with the owner and she hired me on the spot to work as a psychic. Now, I had never worked as a psychic before, but I started working as a psychic the very next day. And interestingly enough, the very next day after doing a couple of psychic sessions, which as it turned out to me, were very much like doing nursing. I don't know if any of you are nurses, but a lot of nursing involves simply just listening to people with your heart and giving them some insights into their situation and their background and what they can do, giving them some choices. So I sat and I listened to people with my heart for a day. And in that short day, I actually made enough money to pay my rent the next day, which was a huge relief, pay my kid, get my kids some food. Um, and that kind of was the initiation into my very strange and scary start as a psychic medium. It was not a career that I was very comfortable with. I know that people took what I said to heart and were take, that they took that information very, very seriously. And it made me very nervous that people took my information so seriously. So I really approached it with a deep, deep sense of responsibility. I did not want to mislead people. And certainly one of the things that I learned in doing this work, and this goes back to what I was saying in my presentation, is that there's no hard, fixed fate. There are certainly some parts of your life that are written into the destiny of who you are. And those events are drawn into your life as part of your destiny. And certainly if you are a fifth or a sixth line profile, you will have more of a fixedness to some of the events that happen in your life. Your, your destiny is a little more fixed than, say, somebody who is a third line profile who has a lot of exploring and experimentation in your process. But there's always choice. You always have choices on how you're going to act, react, create that influence what comes next. And so when we are looking at intuition, we're not looking at, oh, next year on May the 4th, you're going to win the lottery. But rather, we're looking at what patterns and habits do you have? And how are those patterns and habits potentially going to influence what gets created in the future? And if you have a desire for a different outcome in the future, what can you change in the moment to craft a different outcome? That's actually part of intuition is knowing sensing, feeling, which infra bits of information are aligning with the current patterns that are taking me down this path, or which bits of information might be helping me shift my patterns so that I can create a different outcome. And very little, I find, is actually fixed and rigid. You can change your life on a dime if you change the patterns. And part of what we explore when we're looking at patterns, part of what we're exploring when we're looking at patterns and intuition is how do we change the patterns? How do we 
not only change the patterns, but clear away all of that gunk sometimes in our conditioning field that is keeping us from seeing more clearly what is really for our greatest and highest good. So let's talk about some things that you need to do to become more intuitive. The very first thing is you have to decondition. If you want to have a more clear connection to the quantum field, to be able to see greater possibilities and to have greater choice, the truth is awakened, deconditioned, resilient people have more choices in terms of what they can see, in terms of how they can understand information, and in terms of what they can do to influence their future or sense what's possible. So deconditioning becomes a very important part of becoming more intuitive. So let's talk for just a minute about conditioning. There are five kinds of conditioning and we don't always talk about all of them in human design. So I want to just really briefly unpack those five kinds of conditionings so that you can sort of see where perhaps maybe your perception of possibility is being influenced by your conditioning. So the first kind of conditioning is called openness by center. And this is definitely the kind of conditioning that we talk about a lot in human design, particularly in traditional human design. Wherever you have white on your chart or openness in your human design chart, that's where you're taking energy and information in, and you're taking that energy and information in from the world, from the current collective consciousness, you're taking that energy in from the current planetary transits and from the people around you. In that openness, you are experiencing that energy in an amplified way. This is part of the way in which you sense and experience the world, and it's part of how you know the world. But because you experience it in this amplified way, it oftentimes happens that we get confused about this energy. And instead of going, oh, I'm feeling this, where is it coming from? Who around me is having this energy? We tend to go, oh, I am this. And we identify with the energy we're experiencing in our openness. And if we're experienced to certain energies over a long period of time, like say from our parents in our original conditioning field, it gets very easy to begin to permanently think that's a part of who you are. In our openness, because we amplify and because sometimes that amplification can actually be uncomfortable, especially like let's say if you have an open emotional solar plexus or an open identity center, you're amplifying people's stories, you're amplifying the trauma of people's stories, you're amplifying the emotions of people's stories, you're very empathic and it's intense. And many of you who have that configuration right now at the planet at this time, you're feeling it big time. By the way, that's not the only places you feel at big time. And those are certainly not the only places where we are empathic. So you don't have that, but yet you're still feeling it. Please don't discount what you feel. Trust yourself. Trust yourself. Even if your chart doesn't say anything or doesn't reflect anything that you're experiencing, trust your own experience, please. That openness and that intensity and identifying with that intensity oftentimes causes us to do bit, have predictable behavioral patterns that are oftentimes not serving our highest good and sometimes can muddy how we perceive the world. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have an undefined throat or a non-motorized throat. So <clears throat> let's say you're a generator or a projector, or a reflector. Those three energy types, and this is actually what I'm going to talk about in the next quantum element show, I'm going to talk about unmet energies. Those three energy types have an energy need for recognition and attention, because that's how you get your energy activated. You need to be seen, you need to be heard. And being seen and heard is an important part of getting your energy activated. If you don't know that about yourself, and this is why understanding human design is so important. If you don't know that about yourself, you might be making decisions about what you think you want in your life or what you think is truth in your life because you want to be getting attention for what it is that you know or you want to be getting attention for and being seen for doing something that you know is going to get attention conferred upon you because your energy needs to be recognized are sort of influencing how you see the world. 
I think that there, it is an important conversation to have, all of us need to have with ourselves as we share information or embrace information as truth. I think it's a really important piece for us to ask ourselves, why do I like this information? Why am I resonating with this information? And most importantly, why am I sharing this information? Because there's a difference between sharing information because you think this is important. People need to know this versus sharing information because you craft in an identity around being a renegade or being somebody who knows fringy stuff or having something to share because that might be shocking because that shock gets recognition and attention. And these are very subtle and insidious patterns sometimes to explore. These are oftentimes shadow I mean, very often shadow sides of our definition and shadow sides of our openness of our charts that can sometimes make our motivations and our drives a little bit muddied. And I certainly would say in an environment that is potentially inflammatory and certainly as the idea of being binary, that whole concept of being binary, which invariably creates divisiveness because it's this or that in a concept of, of binary thinking that's under intense emotional pressure right now, because we're actually getting ready to leave that behind, but it's under pressure right now. It's very important that we gauge with great responsibility the words we use, the information we share, and really get clear about the motivation underneath why do we feel compelled to share it. Please don't, please know I'm not saying this as a judgment around anything that anybody is saying, because I'm not. I'm inviting all of us to explore before we use the power of language, which creates the template that ultimately has the possibility to be translated into form. Before we use our words and share, what's the driver behind why we're sharing what we're sharing? Because if we're doing it for the right reasons, then that information creates a whole different potential for action. And if we're doing it because we have underlying drivers that are not necessarily true to the alignment with our authentic self, what we end up sharing actually isn't sustainable and actually has the potential to add to the flames of a concept that's under intense emotional pressure. Again, I went on my soapbox, so forgive me for that. Openness by center is a way which we get conditioned. The second way in which we get conditioned is imprinting. Your family of origin, their energy field is going to imprint you, but not just their human design. And I think we have to have this conversation too, because sometimes in traditional human design, we don't talk about this. You are biologically, on a neurological level, conditioned by the way your parents behave, by the way they think, by the way they approach challenge, by the way they deal with frustration, by the way in which they demonstrate or fail to demonstrate resiliency, decision-making skills, their own self-worth. This embodiment of their own consciousness also imprints us. We are informed about how we have we can potentially show up for our own lives by the ways in which our parents behave. By the way, you are also imprinted by the current level of consciousness on the planet. That the way the world is thinking is also influencing you and imprinting you. You are not immune to the conditioning of collective consciousness. We also have generational energy patterns. You actually inherit your human design from your grandparents and your parents inherit theirs from their grandparents. You as a child of your parents are carrying energy that's similar to their parents. And it creates this sort of interesting intergenerational family dynamic that contributes to ancestral lineage and memory and having to work through karmically patterns as an adult that oftentimes have the potential to actually heal your family legacy in many, many ways. Your genetics, your actual genetic makeup, and your ancestral memories that are encoded into the protein coats on your genes, your epigenes, also are going to condition you and influence how you perceive the world and how connected you are to the quantum field or possibility thinking. Last but not least, your own programming. And human design is a very unique way to talk about programming. So I wanna break this down for you 
This is gonna be a super cursory overview of this concept. And for some of you, it might blow your mind if you've never heard it before. For others, you're gonna be like, yeah, yeah, Karen said that before. So you have within you, within your energy field, a crystalline template that is integrated into your human design. At the moment of your conception, your father's energy actually called forth what's called a design crystal out of the earth. That design crystal, which is the crystalline code, it's not a physical thing, you won't find it if you do an autopsy, but it's a crystalline code of information. That design crystal contains the information that dictates your body, the code for how your body unfolds. So it contains the energy for your DNA, your epigenetics, your ancestral memories. It has contained within it the plot outline, if you will, for your life. And so it tells or informs you as to the story of who you are in this incarnation, your human story. That design crystal manifests your life story and your life purpose. Okay, you have two purposes in your human design chart. You have your life purpose and your soul purpose. Part of your job in this incarnation is to find a way to meld those two so that they're happy together and functioning without wrestling with each other. That design crystal is bundled with a magnet. That magnet is called the magnetic monopole. It is a magnet that only attracts. It has one pole and it's an attractive pole. It pulls things into your experience. Your magnetic monopole, the one that is specific to you, is encoded with what your design crystal needs to experience to make you, you in this lifetime. So certain things that are pulled into your life experience, like let's say perhaps for some of you, especially again, my fifth and sixth lines, your soulmate partnerships, the people who you meet who tend up, who end up being catalytic and seminal in your life story, the cataclysmic events that end up being seminal and transform you into the person you are. Some of these things are already encoded into the monopole and they are attracted into your experience. As we evolve, this is a really key and beautiful thing. In the most recent evolution of humanity that started in 1781, one of the things that emerged during this evolution was the energetic capacity for us to intentionally and consciously program this monopole. So our ability to create choice and to program our heart centers, which is actually where the monopole lives, it lives in the heart. That capacity that we have to create from our hearts and influence what we attract into our lives is a fairly new part of our human story. This is a brand new way of being and creating in the world. And the way in which we go about creating is in tremendous flux as we move into this bigger shift in human consciousness. The monopole sits in the G center, which is the diamond in the middle of the chart. The design crystal, by the way, at when, when you're born, takes up residency in the Ajna center. There's one more crystal in code. One more crystal in code called the personality crystal. The personality crystal contains your the code for your soul purpose. Your whole soul can't get here and be inside of you. It's too big, too expansive. It's non-linear. It's not 3D. But you have a code that illuminates the purpose that your soul is seeking to learn through this incarnation. That purpose is encoded into what's called the personality crystal. The personality crystal combined with the design crystal, by the way, the personality crystal resides in the Ajna center. I'll go back to this slide. So the personality crystal sits in the Ajna. I'm sorry, the personality crystal sits in the head center. The design crystal sits in the Ajna. And the monopole lives in the G. The personality crystal, by the way, all the black numbers in your chart, that's the code for your soul purpose. The, all the red numbers in your chart, that's the code for your life purpose. Those are, that's the encoding of the design crystal. The monopole has no, you won't see it on your chart, but the chart is a combination of essentially your soul purpose and your life purpose. The combination of all the, those parts, the design crystal plus the personality crystal and the magnetic monopole makes you, by the way, a once in a lifetime cosmic event. There's never been that combination of energies before. There will never be that combination of energies again. You are literally a unique cosmic event. You're a limited edition. Understanding, by the way, these parts of who you are and understanding sometimes that our intuition is actually also part of our monopole. 
saying, oh, we need to have this experience because it's an essential part of our destiny. I need to move here. I need to go meet this person. I need to go to this city. You know, my, my youngest son, about a, two years ago, felt a deep, deep pull to move to Austin, Texas. He was living in Minneapolis with us at the time. And he was really confused. He was like, why do I need to go here? But he did. And very shortly after he went there, he ran into an old friend from high school who he had met several years ago, and they had sort of been chatty a little bit online, but he hadn't realized she was living in Austin. And of course, they fell in love, and they are now married. He is a six-line profile, so he has a certain amount of fixedness in his destiny. And I do believe his monopole and his intuition as a function of his monopole was telling him, you got to move to Austin because that's where your soulmate lives. The second thing that is important to do as part of activating your intuition is you've got to know yourself. You've got to know yourself. And part of that is understanding that some of what's attracted into your life is part of your design crystal and your monopole, pulling those things in. Your human design tells you a lot about how your intuition works. So in this next little section, this is the part that everybody loves, right? In this next little section, we're going to explore the different kinds of intuition, the different channels that your intuition works with and that how to look at your chart and get a better sense of maybe what your intuitive channel is. If you think about intuition sort of being like, this is gonna date me so much. I used to use this example all the time. Does anybody still like use the dial on your radio? I don't have that even in my car. I have like a button I push. Okay, well, just so the, if you think of your intuition as being a radio, I'll just go with that. And, uh, and, and it's not serious radio, it's regular old radio. And you're like trying to tune into the music that you want. You know, it, your radio, the, the music that you want is coming in on different radio frequencies. And those radio frequencies are calibrated, right, by the dial that you twist if you're really old and remember that like me. Or if you're pushing buttons, if you're more modern, there's probably something even new nowadays. But anyway, each one of those buttons represents a different channel. We are programmed or hardwired to receive intuitive information on many different channels. And our human design hardwiring tells us a lot about what channel we use to receive information. The different intuitive channels are clairvoyancy. This is the one that most people traditionally associate with being psychic or intuitive, right? This is psychic seeing. This is when, uh, if we, I always go back to the I See Dead People movie, it probably also at this point really dates me, but this is the ability to, with your psychic sight, see intuitive information. It's interesting to me when people teach psychic development workshops, oftentimes they are like, this is the gem crown of all psychic abilities. And I don't think that's true at all. I think that's bunk. All of them are the crown jewel of psychic abilities. Everybody's different. And there's not one way of intuiting that's better than others. The way that's right is the way that's best for you. So don't, you know, I think we oftentimes try to develop a certain intuitive capacity. And I think why not develop what you got and use it and trust it and rely on it. Some people are going to be more naturally clairvoyant. They're going to see in their mind's eye. Clear audience is hearing. This is the one that gets a little bit trickier sometimes because this is this has a couple of different permutations. First of all, this is literally intuitive hearing, meaning that sometimes when you have this as your channel, you can hear like when people aren't actually telling the truth, right? Their voice sounds funny and you can tell like there's something that's off with how that, what they're saying. This is also having an inner hearing, like you'll hear voices which, you know, I worked for about six months as a nurse in a psychiatric unit, and I'm always a little bit nervous about telling people, you should listen to the voices in your head. <laughs> but you should listen to the voices in your head if they're telling you good things. If you have a voice in your head that's telling you terrible things, then we need to get rid of that because that's not, that's not clear audience. That's probably your conditioning and probably a symptom of low self-worth. So clear audience is hearing intuitive information. And sometimes if you really learn to tune into that, you'll learn to hear that that voice, that psychic voice you hear, your guidance, has a very different cadence than even your own voice. Clear sentience is sort of being empathic. It's feeling intuitive information, and it 
can be done sort of very viscerally. So sometimes it's like it hits you and it just doesn't feel right. Sometimes it's that those goosebump confirmations that some of you get or uh, your hair's kind of standing up on end. We feel intuitive information. Clear olfactants is kind of an odd one, but it's an, it's an interesting one. I have a daughter that has this. She's um, she, clear olfactants means you literally smell psychic information. And actually, if you think about our language, we have built into our language words that indicate that our we have an intuitive sense of smell, right? We say something like, you say, oh, I smell a rat or hmm, something smells off about this, right? That's a statement that we make that sort of implies something doesn't smell right. And that's a different way of saying there's some old, clear all effect that's happening here. You'll find sometimes, especially if you're medically intuitive, that you can smell when somebody isn't well. I, as I said, my oldest daughter has this, and we, we joke she's the pregnancy sniffer. She can smell when women are pregnant it, like instantly, way before they even get a positive pregnancy test. It's really interesting to hang out with her. And if people are sick, she can't be around sick people because she can really literally like smell it. Um, clear all the factors too, if you are working, say, with somebody who has, uh, like if you're working with a psychic medium or some really good psychic mediums, they can smell the sense of people who have crossed over. Like um, this is this is one of my one of my intuitive channels. Um, and when I do mediumship, when I did, I don't do them anymore. When I did mediumship readings, I could always smell the person, the crossed over loved one. So sometimes if somebody drank a lot of coffee, you could smell coffee in the air. Um, it was very common for older gentlemen to show up with the smell of cigar. Angels oftentimes showed up and you could smell roses in the air if you connected with angelic energy. Uh, uh, dreaming is another way many of us receive intuitive information. We get our information at nighttime or in dream time. And claircognizance is actually a really profound way of, of being intuitive, but it also can sometimes be, especially in our more linear world, the more exasperating way to be intuitive. That's knowingness. You know that you know. You don't know how you know that you know. You just know. And it's very difficult sometimes when you have claircognizance to try to explain to people why it is you know what you know. There are three sources of intuition. I put this in air quotes because it's actually a little bit different. And we oftentimes talk about intuition. And when we're talking about intuition, we're actually talking about instinct. So I want to break these things down for you a little bit as we go through the rest of this little program. So the first thing is uh, when we are, the first way in which we are intuitive is through our openness. And this is certainly a way in which we experience intuitive information as empath as empaths. This is a way we sense and feel the people around us. And it is a way that we, it's, it's very different, clair, clairsentient, if you have a lot of empathy or, or a lot of openness in your chart, you're really going to express your understanding of others through how you feel them through your openness. That energy is going to come to you from other people's energy fields that are impacting yours. The second way of being intuitive is actually our instinct, our animal survival instinct. Your splenic center is designed to give you an instinctive pulse, and that pulse often comes, usually almost always, is or comes in the form of fear. That fear actually is an important pulse. You know, we talk a lot about fear being, oh, we don't want to be in fear. We want to ignore fear. Fear is bad. Fear actually is really, really good under certain circumstances. So if you get that sort of fear-based, like, I should not go into this dark building in the middle of the night feeling, that's an important, intuitive, instinctual impulse that is telling you your survival is potentially under threat. and You should not do this. We, I don't want you all to discount the real purpose of fear. And fear has a purpose of actually protecting us and keeping us safe. And I think sometimes we try to bypass it. Now, I want to just add a little disclaimer here. This center is under a tremendous amount of, of evolutionary pressure. And part of what is happening as a result of this evolutionary pressure is as human beings, because we're so much more complex than animals, 
our instinct gets very convoluted over here in the spleen center. And if you want to learn more about how that might be keeping you paralyzed in fear that isn't, doesn't have anything to do with your survival, but you are designed to have a fear-based instinctive response that gives you a pulse of action, and it is an action-based pulse, that causes you to, without a whole lot of conscious thought, do something spontaneous that's action-based to protect your life. You might run from a bear, right? Or you might choose to not go in a dark house. Or you might listen to that inner prompting that's telling you, hmm, shouldn't go to Texas right now on vacation, right? Some of those kinds of things. Real, actual intuition, and this is not, the way I'm saying this is not to discount those other two pieces because those are also equally valid ways in which we understand and experience and know the world and what actions we need to take. But real intuition beyond sensing, feeling, being empathic comes from different elements in the chart. These are the places where we are able to, by design, leap over that conditioning field and see bigger possibilities, bigger parts of the timeline, other options for our current reality and have deeper insights and awarenesses as to what's actually going on in our lives. So I'm gonna run through this next section in the presentation and I'm gonna encourage you as I go through this to print this off, get your chart out and start looking at your own chart and see what do you have defined in your chart, and how might that be influencing the way in which you experience your own intuition and your knowingness around what is truth for you or not. So clairvoyance, seeing, and also dreaming, those two channels, are associated with the gate 63, the gate 64, and the gate 61. Clear audience, hearing, psychic hearing, is very, very often associated with the knowing circuit or any individual circuitry. This here is the knowing circuit. Clear audience is also associated with the centering circuit and the integration circuit. So again, individuality here. In particular, this channel, the 3457, some of you may have this whole channel defined. This is a channel that not only has a deep capacity to hear alignment or misalignment on an auditory level, this is also a channel that can very often be associated with people who work with sound, including people who use sound for healing purposes. The gate 22 is associated associate with the right ear and hearing and you'll often people who have this 12 and even the 1222 this channel is a, a channel is very often associated with channeling and there's an internal clear audience or hearing that happens here clairsentience is of course remember it's also anywhere where you have openness is clairsentience you'll also it's very most commonly associated with an open g center as well as an open emotional solar plexus so yes these are colored in on these two examples, but it's actually when it's white in your chart. Again, we're looking at big picture items here, you guys. Many of you are super intuitive and there are other places, more minuscule, more unique configurations that can that contain intuitive ability. We, and we all have intuitive ability, by the way. That's not something that's exclusive to some people. We all are intuitive by design. So please, 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 as we're going through this, if you're like, well, I don't have this and I don't have that and I don't have this, does this mean I'm an intuitive, un, a non-intuitive rock? No, you are intuitive. And there are many, many configurations that influence our intuition. Open G centers and open emotional solar plexus z -z -z, <laughs> tend to be more clairsentient. The sensing circuit, which is all about storytelling and emotional feelings and embodiment and sensuality and sensing the world, has a lot of clairsentience associated with it. These are people that often can tell true stories. If you have this energy, you can tell true stories about people, even if they can't see the truth about themselves. 
Clairsentience too can often happen in the channel 1949, especially if you have the gate 19 defined. This is a very, very sensitive, aware channel that has deep emotional awareness of what people need to be intimate and deeply connected or not. Clear olfactants, that's psychic smelling, is often associated or most commonly associated with the channel 4426. So this is the gate of sm the, the channel where smelling is located. This is also sort of, um, I hate to call this channel, I'm going to use a bad word here for a minute. This is an internal BS detector with this channel. You can totally sense when you have this, anything defined in this channel, whether it's both gates, a gate, one gate, two gates, the channel. If you've got any definition in this channel, your ability to feel when someone's in or out of integrity is pretty high. Clear cognizance is knowingness. It's interesting to note that knowingness and clear audience are located in the same places. That makes translation of what you know into words that much more challenging. It's often difficult when you have a lot of knowingness to translate it. Like you know, but you don't even know how to say it sometimes. Like you just feel it. The second thing that makes knowingness a little bit more challenging is, is if you have any logical definition or you have people in your life who have a lot of logical definition in their chart they're going to want to demand how do you know that and you can't tell them how you know that you just know it and and if you have logic in your own chart it causes you to doubt your own knowingness if you have an open head or an open ajna which is most of you you will tend to be good mind readers which is important for you to understand because if you're standing in the energy field of someone who has a defined head in Ajna, you're absorbing the way that they think. And you could be potentially absorbing their inspirations, their ideas, their thoughts, their belief systems. And if you're not careful, it can cause you to misidentify with your own drivers and your own ideas and your own motivations. An open throat is often really powerful when you want to be a channel or a lot of good channels have open throats, undefined throat centers. The channel 1222, especially the gate 12, which is the one that connects to the throat, is also very commonly associated with people who channel. And when I'm saying channeling, I'm not just saying, you know, the people who are rolling their heads up into their eyes and some entity is coming through them and they're talking in a strange voice. This is having access to divine information and transmitting it without having a whole lot of awareness of it. So you might be, let's say you work as a therapist or a counselor or a coach, you might, and you have this definition in your chart, you might find that you say things to people as part of your therapy sessions or your coaching sessions, and they're eloquent and they're brilliant. And your clients are like, whoa, can you say that again? And you can't <laughs> because you just brought that information out of the cosmic field, out of the quantum field, through your mouth. And it's not existing on the timeline anymore. It's gone. So I always recommend if you've got this configuration, you better be recording your session so your clients can go back and listen to your brilliance. You should go listen to it too. Also, if you have an, a defined head in Ajna, but no connection between the Ajna and the throat, that's also oftentimes a nice configuration for channeling. Again, if you have none of these in your channel, that doesn't mean you're not a channel. It just means you don't have these defined in your chart. These are associations and common, common correlations in the chart. There's not a this makes this kind of a configuration in the chart, all right? The spleen. The gate 48 tells you when you know enough. The gate 57 gives you the intuitive pulse that helps you know the future. The gate 44 helps you understand the past. The gate 50 gives you the intuitive awareness to know what others need. The gate 32 gives you a deep inner sense of when the timing is right. The gate 28 gives you an instinct around what's worth living and fighting for. And the gate 18 has an intuitive awareness of what patterns need to be corrected to make things more joyful. The sensing circuit has a deep capacity to understand the past and what has come before. The logical circuit understands patterns and is really, really good at predicting the future based on its understanding of patterns. That's what science is. And last but not least, and I'm not going to take credit for this, this is based on the work of Dr. Eleanor Haspel Kortner, who has done amazing, amazing, really deep, rich work in many, many areas of human design. Um, but 
doing in some, according to some of her research and her work, angels themselves have a design. And the people who have definition in any of these gates or channels oftentimes are able to very easily plug into angelic circuitry and have a really clear connection to angelic energy and use that energy as a source of guidance and information. All right, just to review, remember your conditioning and your human design is gonna influence how your intuition works. It's a muscle. And the more you can build that muscle, the better able you are to interpret that information and to go beyond your conditioning to see what feels like truth to you. I want to just end with this thought, and this is an important thought, and this is what we'll be unpacking in my next session. It's very difficult to have a clear connection if you haven't healed your own trauma. When we experience trauma of any kind, and in my definition of trauma, that's any event, perception, or experience that's caused you to lose your connection with your own lovability, with your own sense of value, and your right place in the world, you haven't cleared that trauma. You create what's called a protective identity. That identity is something you put in place to keep yourself safe so you won't be re-traumatized. Protective identities make it really hard sometimes to see what's true because they're always funneling perception through what's necessary to keep you safe in a reactive way. So we have to explore the role that trauma plays sometimes in our intuitive perception and our understanding of what is true. In the next session, I'm going to talk about unmet energy needs, your human design type, and how to understand reactivity versus your intuition. Awesome. All right. You all have a great week and a great weekend. Thank you all for joining me. We'll see you soon. Bye.